Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Pauline Baird from Buxton, Guyana. I'm a cultural bearer. I tell the stories of my village. I tell our whispered stories, our family histories, our hidden practice and sometimes long forgotten traditions. Today, my wife a talk story, but Creoles, love a story. What is story say? You see, a village picked up star Creoles. Them attack Creoles in the house, them attack Creoles outside the house. Them mama and then daddy attack Creoles too. So all body attack Creoles. But you see, in school, they not stack Creoles and English. They pick me them who attack Creoles at house when they go to school and go to talk English. They go to learn English. And sometimes they think I bring problem. It's very bad duration for picnic. So, I'm going to tell you one story about one little girl who been living with one family of the East Coast. I know she not belong to Buxton. I'm going to tell you why soon. The picnic they live with your family. Like we call the girl Lisa. Lisa. Let's say Lisa about eight years old or so. And Lisa family then come from America. And one little girl like a Lisa, they write there. And the little girl speak twang up, twang up like you come from America. So Lisa look outside one day and she see one, one thing I go on to do. And she decide for report upon the thing. Lisa run out of the yard and say, Auntie Minky, Auntie Minky, nurse dog are biting Abby puppy. Eh, eh. First thing you want to say, this picnic you want to sound like America, but she talk with. American sounding accent with Creoles. Aunt Minky, Aunt Minky, nurse dog are biting Abby puppy. Well, let me break down Lisa language. If you've been a Lisa teacher and you've been a teach one Creoles class, how about grade Yogi Lisa? Well, let me tell you how me grade Lisa. First of all, let me look at Lisa's grammatical subject. The subject is nurse dog. So we know we get established. We know Lisa not talking English because in English you not say nurse dog. You got to say nurse's dog. Or the dog that belongs to nurse. Well, the predicate part. Well, I you got to decide if I go take me side or I go get on your own side. Because this answer got two different things you can go with. First of all, Lisa say nurse dog are biting Abby puppy. Well, we know if you get one dog in English and you put R with one in our walk, you got to get Plural verb with plural subject, right? But a is now works, so you know. Mm -mm. Creelies, you can't say that. Because, but from the time Lisa say R, we got to understand that now one dog she see, a more than one dog. Because when we see plenty dog, we doesn't say, um, we see plenty dogs or plenty dogs. That are, that are Creoles. Now, at least a box and Creoles. We just say them get two dog. Three dog, hundred a dog, all a dog. One a dog and all a dog. So, how the linguist go understand if a plural or not? If you say, nurse dog been, nurse dog a bite up, a we puppy? We can, we don't decide, we can decide if have one or more. But if she say, nurse dog are biting, we can say that the dogs are more than one. If she say nurse dog a bite up our puppy, we can still say a one dog. Right? Either way, the answer right. So Lisa, correct. Now, if we want to dig a little bit more into Lisa's language, for learn a little bit more about Lisa, this language tells us something about regional dialect, where Lisa really from. From here in down, we know Lisa not come from Georgetown. Uh -uh. Lisa would have say nurse dog is um, biting with puppy or something like that. Closer to English. A Buxton, we go say, nurse dog a bite a with puppy. Nurse dog then been a bite up a with puppy. A with puppy. But when Lisa say, a with puppy, Lisa is closer going to Borbies and into East Indian territory. Because then I say, a be. Now, when you break down all of Lisa's language, you know, construction and so on. We understand that Creolese is rich. It tells us about how people speak and how they regard the grammar of the language. Kids are people to observe very closely because they can tell you something about the language. I'm not sure if they really understand at a um, overt level what they're doing, but they understand how to mimic the language because they, they pick it up. Um, they have the grammar of the first language. And I know this because my sister in New York had, um, has a daughter. I made no human, so I don't know this because I make this human. My sister make the human. So, 
my niece was sitting there and she decided to proceed to tell her mother about her two foots. So my, my sister said, no, you don't have two foots, you have two feet. She listened and she went right on saying foots. Now, people might say this kid does no grammar, but the kid does. The kid has observed the English grammar that one has no S and two has S. Understands how to use the S. What the kid doesn't understand is the rule of the zero morpheme, as the linguists would say, that operates inside of the word foot, because foot comes from a different language. It's not, a, it's not an English origin, it's some, another language. And so the, the way it pluralizes is not on the end, but in the middle with feet. So the kid doesn't know that yet. Um, another time she said, Mommy, I saw the childs. I saw two childs. And she said, oh no, no kill then, it's not childs, they're children. But she insists they were childs. So, if children who are learning English in America by listening are making those kinds of um, utterances, what about the kids in the village? They're making utterances that they kind of intuit about how language works. So we can learn from Lisa how she's, con how she's using her verb and how she's doing her, her stuff. What, is the, what, is, what does this mean for language teaching and for those who have an interest in the role of Creole in, in society and Guyanese Creoles, or Guyanese Creole? You know, I would say that this is a prime opportunity to let little bilingual Lisa know some things about what's happening in her language and what's happening in another language. Um, I'm reading this book called Creole Composition, and the authors of this book contend that there's a problem with students when they, when they are, when they are Creole influenced, especially when it comes to writing. They take orality into writing, and they want to write the same way. But this is an opportunity to look at that language to say how do they compare, and show them opportunities of how to use the mother tongue. The, or, or one of their languages within academia. Um, I wouldn't say it's incorrect to, read, to use Creolese in an English setting, and I'm going to give you an example, an academic setting. When I wrote GC, I had to write a story, or I chose to write a story about something in the village or something. And I remember talking about the Indian woman who would jal the, the shrimps and fish in the, in the trench. And when she's finished, she would go and sell them. So I wrote my story and I wrote something like, she would say, fish, fish, are you come by are you fish? Fish, come by are you fish? Now, if I'm writing this story for people all in England who go read this paper, this GC paper, and I want to talk about the experience of the East Indian woman in the trench, what am I gonna say? She was crying, fish, fish, come and get your fish, come and get your fish, nonsense. I can't write it like that. So I draw on my Creolese to share that story, to show and to be seen, and more than that, to be heard. I want them to hear the cadence of the language. I want them to hear what she said, so I wrote in Creolese. What scholars are advocating, some scholars, is code meshing, where we find opportunities to infuse our Creolese in academic settings so that we can be seen and heard. Because beneath our Creole experience language or influence language, some of these nuances come out. And I also want to say, many of us might, might think that when we speak what's so-called standard English or that which has been decided by society is the standard that we need to use for formal situations, we don't necessarily always write in English or speak in English. I catch myself sometimes dropping my H's, sometimes doing some fancy things with syntax, and at the time I'm doing those things, I am not speaking English. But people listening to me who expect English in that situation might say, what the world is she doing? She's not speaking English. What, what, what's this? And so I have this strange English that they say, but actually I wasn't speaking English. And that happens to me a lot when I get comfortable with foreigners or people who are not from my culture. When I get comfortable, I can easily slip, I can code switch and go right into Creolese because that's where my heart is. And so I embrace it, I would speak it and you know, you know, put it out there. I, but I have to remember 
that language is for purpose and it's highly negotiated, always highly negotiated. So I think with this whole notion of queer leaves, we have an opportunity to talk about how we negotiate this language. What do we gain from it? Because formal English language has social capital. It's that which we use for social uplift and to move up in society. We're not saying not let, not let our kids learn that. Yes, they need that. And, and they can do that. If people in some countries can learn five and six languages, we can. We can keep Creoles. We don't have to throw away Creoles at all. Creoles can bear the fullness of our cultural Caribbean experiences, our Guyanese experiences, our Buxton experiences, all our experiences. So let's embrace our language and let's teach our children. Let's examine this. And if I get a story like this, I tell me. Tell me how uh, in other ways, Lisa, can talk the same sentence. I work good. <laughs>